Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shat, episode 173, featuring the second part of my interview with Lori and Corey Cole. Now, if you happen to miss it, I interviewed Lori and Corey a few episodes back uh, where they were talking about their Hero U Rogue to Redemption Kickstarter project, which, by the way, only has 48 hours left, and they're just shy about 60 grand. Uh, so please, if you haven't uh, pledged that Kickstarter yet, stop the video now. Go over there and pledge. They could really use your support. Now, I'd really like to see that Hero U game actually get funded. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Quest for Glory uh, first game, and as well as uh, uh, Lori and Corey's background in game development. So, without further ado, here is Lori and Corey Cole. Let's get into the history uh, then. Uh, I thought it'd be fun to hear uh, the story of how you two met. I mean, I read a little bit about it online, and uh, apparently it was during a Dungeons and Dragons uh, game. Pretty much. Well, I had uh, done something uh, where I had been working down in Los Angeles and was really into playing Dungeons & Dragons, and uh, the uh, I went to Caltech and played their variant of it, and I was just so much into this game that I wanted to spend all my time doing it, but unfortunately I had this thing called work and making a living and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, I had uh, done a dungeon uh, with a, a group I played with in, uh, out in Chicago, went to Chicago uh, off and on business. Uh, and uh, they liked it a lot, so I actually wrote up that scenario, added detail and so on, and submitted it to a company called Judges Guild uh, that uh, pretty much sat on it. And I called them up uh, and said, uh, uh, so are you going to publish my uh, scenario? And they said, oh, did you send that to us for publication? We've really had a great time. We've been playing that every, uh, every week. Uh, <laughs> and I said, uh, no, I was actually kind of hoping you'd publish it. And they said, oh, okay, yeah, we'll get right on that. Uh, so uh, that was in the works at the point where I was going to uh, some science fiction conventions, which I went to because I heard there was D&D at science fiction conventions. Uh, and uh, there was this uh, uh, really cute uh, woman that uh, came to uh, one of my games there. And so I was, uh, you know, playing the game and, of course, flirting with her because that's me. Uh, and uh, we got to, uh, I, I think uh, I liked her because uh, she was uh, cute and female and uh, she liked me because I was a good dungeon master. <laughs> yeah, I was visiting my aunt in San Francisco at the time, and I came across, oh, there's a science fiction convention in town right now, and did I really want to go to it? Yeah, it would be kind of fun to go to, and I had played a variation on, on Dungeon and Dragons, and I really enjoyed it. So I was, you know, wandered down to the gaming room because I wanted to play but I wasn't sure if I, you know, if I was going to. And he said, oh, come, come play. Yes, yes, please. So I which, was like. Which actually was as much about the fact that we were short of players as anything else. But, uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, we hit it off. Uh, we had some, uh, you know, talked a lot, uh, did things together for the con. And uh, Lori went back to Arizona. I went back to L.A. And uh, we started corresponding. So we could corresponded for like two years, you know, because I didn't even have a phone working on the Indian reservation in Arizona, you know, as a teacher. So it was all letter writing, you know. I think the turning point for me actually was the first little postcard I got from Lori. Uh, she had uh, written uh, something that was, you know, talking about uh, the, you know, the sunset. It was just very, very romantic and uh, uh, very storytelling. Uh, and that kind of forced me to up my game a little bit, uh, that I had to respond in kind. Uh, and so we had a correspondence that, uh, uh, you know, was was real life, but it was also kind of storytelling in there. And uh, I had never really had an opportunity to, to stretch my, uh, you know, my writing muscles that way. Uh, so that was that was kind of fun. It was it was romantic and it was unusual. Do you have all these postcards and correspondence in a box somewhere? It's probably in a file drawer, actually. I doubt that I still have mine. <laughs> I, no, I, came across, I came across yours oh, at one point. Okay. Yeah, we, may, we may still have those in a drawer. Yeah. Well, then uh, you were also playing Wizardry on the on a computer. What computer was that? Uh, Wizardry, yeah. We actually, that's the uh, story. We wrote a song about that, uh, or Lori did. Uh, uh, that that was one where we said we played uh, Wizardry on Borrowed Time. I guess that was my song, actually. Yeah, it was yours. We, we each wrote one. Uh, and uh, we played that in Apple IIs. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, we actually went into the place where a friend worked, and they had the Apple IIs that they were using for work. Uh, and we would stay up till three or four in the morning uh, with uh, everyone exhausted the next day trying to do <laughs> real yeah, work. Yeah, so we were playing it as a as collaborative effort. You know, Wizardry had four characters, and we had four different people there, and we each had our own character, you know, and we were, you know, saying, oh, this one eats this, or, or whatever. We were putting what role-playing we could into the game, but it was really a group effort and was much more fun because it wasn't a solo game for us. Yeah, I, th I think our favorite game of that period was Dungeon Master when it first came out for the Atari ST. Uh, that was an absolute tour de force. And the fact that they fit that huge game onto a single uh, double-sided uh, you know, or double-density Atari floppy disk uh, that was, uh, uh, I guess it was 720K of, uh, of disk space for the entire game. And they had a really rich uh, experience, part of which was enhanced by having a manual that told the story, but uh, uh, that was kind of the, you know, our idea of the, the best, most involving game of the time. It's funny you should mention the Atari ST because uh, that's how you got your job at uh, Sierra, right? Converting games for the, or converting the engine to the Atari ST. What, did you just like the Atari ST or how did you get? Well, well, I've told this, actually I hadn't told that part of the story. Why was I in the Atari ST was because uh, I had previously worked for a company that was doing uh, professional publishing uh, uh, computer systems, uh, and I had the idea of doing a, a personal desktop publishing system, and my company poo-pooed it. They said, oh, who would want something like that? Uh, so I quit and started my own uh, uh, company, and looking at the choices, IBM, was, uh, IBM PC was the obvious one, uh, but I said, how much leverage can I get against companies like Microsoft? Uh, now, Microsoft Word at that point, that. Microsoft Word wasn't a real desktop publishing system at that point. It was just a word processor. It was very simple. Uh, but the Atari ST had just been announced, and I looked at this and it said, okay, it's got graphics, it's got fonts, it's got all the things that, uh, that we were using in our uh, $20,000 professional uh, uh, publishing systems in a, uh, you know, a $1,000 or $2,000 computer. Actually, I think it might have even been less than that. I said, you know, I can leverage this. And unfortunately, there were a few little things they didn't tell us, which is that they took some shortcuts on the way out the door. And that, for instance, the font uh, system didn't work when they shipped the Atari ST. Uh, but I spent uh, a couple of years uh, uh, developing my desktop publishing system. I was working with Start Magazine and the people up there. Uh, and so I actually did it just because that was the right computer uh, for getting noticed without being one of a sea of titles on the IBM PC. Uh, and that led to uh, uh, talking with Ken Williams uh, because, well, actually we were there for a different reason. Yes, we were there for a different reason. His asthma was getting bad, and all of a sudden it became clear that we were, I mean, when we started, there was no Windows on the PC. I mean, Windows had just barely started to hit the PC. And so it wasn't clear if Windows would be the winner or the Atari ST the, would be the winner. So we couldn't tell at the time. But by the time, by two years in, it was clear that the Windows would win, and the Atari ST was not going to be the next, you know, the next PC for everybody. So that was dying down. We ha he had asthma. We had to find a new way of making a living because it wasn't working. And so, therefore, that's when we were looking for a, a way out. Yeah, we said San Jose is no longer the place for us. I really can't live here. Uh, and right about then, we had a friend that, uh, going back to science fiction conventions, Carly Hawk's daughter, uh, was a friend of ours that we had done folk singing with. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's the, uh, uh, you know, singing uh, folk songs with uh, science fiction fantasy themes. And Carly had been doing animation work on uh, King's Quest IV, which uh, was uh, Sarah's next upcoming game, uh, and she said, you know, I was just in a meeting with Ken Williams, and they're looking for, uh, you know, our next generation of games, and uh, Sierra had just lost the license to the Ultima series uh, in a uh, dispute with Lord British, uh, and Ken said, well, we need a new Ultima too. We need somebody to come in here who's an expert, tournament-level, uh, award-winning uh, dungeon master, uh, and... Uh, so we look at Carly and says, you know, there isn't any such thing. And she says, well, yeah, but that's what Ken's looking for. Uh, so she got us in contact with Ken Williams, 
And I said, yes, absolutely. We're award-winning uh, tournament level uh, dungeon masters. Cause I said, well, you know, I once played in a, a Dungeons and Dragons game in a tournament and I won first prize. So that makes me award-winning. And well, certainly we're dungeon masters. Uh, and, uh, and, well, we've got this published module, so not only that, but I'm a published uh, dungeon master. So we went in, uh, and Ken was like, okay, well, I've got, you know, uh, 20 people working here already, and every one of them thinks they're a game designer. What makes you any better? And I said, well, you know, we've been doing this, and in addition, I'm a programmer. I've been programming for 10 years, uh, and I know how to communicate my ideas to programmers so that they can do it well. Uh, you know, like I, I just have been doing this project, the Atari ST, and all of a sudden the phone call changed because Ken said, oh, the Atari ST. Uh, and what I didn't know about at the time was that Sierra had a huge contract with Atari to convert all their games over to the Atari ST, and they had exactly one programmer in-house, uh, which was Bob Heitman, who had ever worked on the Atari before. Uh, so they didn't know how to do it. They had this contract, and they had nobody that could do it. Uh, Bob was uh, one of their lead system programmers, and he didn't have time for it. Uh, so they actually, instead of hiring me as a uh, game designer, uh, they hired me as uh, their Atari ST programmer. Well, uh, I'm curious about the pitch uh, for Heroes Quest. I mean, did you was it was there some resistance because of the changes that would need to be made uh, to the engine? No, actually, what Corey went to work as a programmer on the Atari ST conversions and not as a game designer but that gave us a time to see what were they doing at Sierra and the engine wasn't well designed to do an Ultima game I mean and it made no sense to go back and have somebody reprogram an Ultima because they didn't have any of the rights to Ultima so I sat there and said, what can we do with what they do well, which is present an adventure game. And, you know, one of our frustrations with the, you know, Ultima games uh, was that it didn't really have a rich story. It promised there was story, but they were just, you know, little bits and pieces of story, and it really didn't tell a coherent, really good D&D &D style adventure where you really felt like there's, there's this moving, sweeping event going on, and we wanted to put that in a game. And one of the uh, uh, strengths that Sierra had is that in addition to uh, doing uh, nice-looking graphics, is they had a text parser that allowed you to uh, enter in reasonably rich uh, English sentences and get reasonable responses to it. Uh, Ultima allowed you to uh, you know, enter one-word commands, job, name, and so on. And to us, that kind of... Uh, you know, it was, it was nice that you could have a conversation, but it wasn't very rich. Uh, whereas uh, uh, we can do things like, say, uh, uh, you know, ask about the land of Shapir, and the, uh, uh, there's, you know, their tools would actually interpret that and do something reasonable with it. Uh, so we said, we can do a storytelling game that uses the adventure characteristics. And I said, you know, I'm a pretty good uh, programmer, and I can build a level of uh, system on top of their engine uh, that will do uh, traditional role-playing things like stats and skills uh, and we had done something that was uh, that was different from other role-playing games because of Lori's experience with the Arizona version of D&D &D, uh, is that instead of uh, having levels and when you go up a level you get one skill or something uh, we had been working with skill-based uh, systems, and we had all done our own game system based on that and said, okay, let's do one where as you go along and you practice skills that you get better at them. So we said, we can do something unique here, and we can fit this in to the existing Sierra tools uh, without having to build an entirely new engine. I and mean, Sierra had put a million dollars and more into development of the, those tools they use for adventure games. Uh, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. One thing that everybody talks about uh, that you know, the, all the fans of the series they love the the stories and the characters, and I'm wondering uh, what kind of uh, research did you do, or, or how did you come up with all this stuff? Well, actually, we did a fair amount of research. I mean, face it, we were we were readers. We read all the time. We played games all the time. Um, and I grew up, you know, with fairy tales, with mythology and folk tales. And what we wanted to do when we created the series is, and we knew it was a series, I pitched it as a series when I went into Sierra, that 
I wanted to, you know, the first game was set in a Germanic, you know, traditional fairy tale type of setting because I, I knew I was introducing a group of players who didn't play RPGs particularly. They were adventure games. This was Sierra's strength. So I wanted to give them something they could easily understand, a culture, an area they could understand, and all the tropes that they would recognize. The castle, the hero idea, and I'd sort of turn them up over end because that's the way I am. And uh, make it something, okay, they start out being familiar, they can understand where they're going, and it looks like an adventure game when you're, you're beginning out. And it's only as you play, you realize there are more levels to it, and there's more to the story than what you expected when you start out. Yeah, so in terms of a pitch to Sierra, uh, Lori did uh, uh, you know, some uh, colored pencil drawings of some characters, uh, and I basically just laid out a, a, a cell sheet to Sierra Management that said, okay, here's how this is similar to Sierra Games, here's what's different and unique. Uh, here's uh, you know who our target market is. Here's why they'll buy it, uh, and you know they liked uh, that that instead of coming up and saying uh, you know we're making this game that's uh, uh, you know about a, an adventurer, we didn't even talk about that. Uh, we talked about why it was going to benefit Sierra, and that, that's the same thing. That's how we got the job there too. Is we went in there and said we have skills that will benefit Sierra. Uh, and uh, that's good advice for anyone going uh, going out for a job interview is don't talk about yourself so much. Uh, talk about them because uh, they know what you know they know what they're looking for and they really like hearing over and over again what they're already doing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we we actually both had kind of a stealth education for computer games. We've got computer game schools now. They didn't have that uh, when we started out. But both of us read a lot of mythology. We read a lot of fantasy stories. Uh, Lori uh, uh, had a, uh, uh, an education major, but a minor in literature, and what she was doing when she wasn't doing those two was taking art classes. And animation classes. Yeah. I had really, I loved animation. I loved the whole, I uh, loved voice acting. I loved everything that was involved with that. So it really was like, Sierra was a great mesh because we were, the, the, you know, animation, you know, it was like doing a live action, well, a, a cartoon in which you're really telling a story. And I'd been trying to do that from, you know, I used to do cells, you know, cell animation just for fun with a little Super 8 camera. And it wasn't really effective, but it was something I wanted to do. So, you know, it was like the, the Creating games at Sierra was a culmination of what we had done most of our lives. This is what we wanted to do. And for me, I had, uh, was a programmer, but I got there. My degree is actually in math, but it's from a, uh, a unit called the College of Creative Studies at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and they emphasize that math is not just uh, you know, a boring thing sitting on paper. But it really is a creative exercise. And if you want to make real discoveries in mathematics, then you have to uh, think outside the box, and you have to, uh, you know, explore and create. Uh, and they also encouraged us to take uh, outside of our discipline classes. So I had uh, taken a, uh, a class called uh, Art and Literature, uh, where we did, uh, you know, study a whole bunch of books that had to do with artists, uh, and then wrote about the difference between these books. So I had done, like, Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead and uh, uh, contrasting that with uh, uh, kind of Botoc, I think, with The Chosen or something like that. And so, you know, I had a very eclectic education, uh, and of course I was spending my time reading and playing games, uh, so I kind of had that, you know, the balance between the right half and the left half of the brain uh, that we're bringing into this. So, you know, basically both of us studied how to create computer games and different sides of it without knowing we were doing it. Well, another thing that is highly praised about the, uh, the game is the multiple solutions to the puzzles, and I saw a lot of... Uh, previous interviews where you talked about this and the uh, guess the designer's mind uh, school of design uh, uh -huh. so can you just you know talk a little bit about what you saw wrong with what was going on <laughs> at the time and then your uh, your solution okay uh, rule number one the player must have fun and rule number two is the player wants to win well and most adventure games suck 
I did not <laughs> like adventure games. I don't want to be frustrated by my game. Careful, Royal, and in our audience here. I know. It's <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I want to be able to do something. I don't want to have to spend 12 minutes trying to type a command. Now, the first game, I, computer game I've ever played, because I never touched, we didn't have, we had games, we had little pre, pre computer game games and handheld in, the, in my life, and the Atari type games, uh, the, with the, the controller type games, but we didn't have a computer. And my first game was Adventure, you know, the Cursed Cave or whatever it's Lossal called, cave. Lossal Cave. And it's like, what do you do? You have to type, and you have to say something, go north or north. This was really, you know, i get stuck, and then I wouldn't know what to do, and how do you do this? And I did not want a game that I had to keep saying, what do you do now? I wanted a game that you could do something and keep doing something, and you wouldn't hit your head against a puzzle that you couldn't solve. You know, yeah, if, if you don't count, uh, uh, you know, chess and uh, tic tac toe, then probably uh, Classical Cave Adventure was my first computer game, also. And I encountered that very briefly in a visit to UCLA that was kind of a uh, you know, learn about the college day uh, when I was in high school. Uh, and somebody sat me down at a teletype that was connected to University of Utah, uh, uh, where, uh, where they had uh, adventure running and ran me through it. And of course, they immediately gave me a spoiler to one of the puzzles of, uh, you know, how to defeat the dragon there. I was like, okay, did you really have to tell me what the answer was to that? Uh, uh, and uh, a few years later, uh, I was working a, a profession. I took a year off school to work for a company called GIAC Canada. Uh, and someone had ported the original Fortran version of uh, Adventure to the language we were working in up there. And I had played through it. I got totally frustrated. I think we had the extended version that had a possible 350 points. And I had solved the game and gotten 349 out of 350. And it was killing me. I had to have that last point. Uh, so I talked to the person who had done the port, and he sent me uh, the uh, nine-track uh, magnetic tape that had the uh, source code for it. Uh, and I proceeded to debug the source code and put in commands because, you know, there were these little cryptic clues in there that said, you know, get the extra point for doing the right thing with something. Uh, so uh, I went through and debugged the game and went around until uh, uh, I hit the uh, break point I put in that said, uh, ah, here's where you get the one point. I said, okay, what do you have to do there? Ah, okay, and then I got my last point, and finally I was satisfied that I got my 350. So I, I'm really kind of a perfectionist and a completist. And it's all about having fun. You know, what do you interpret as fun? <laughs> What he interprets as fun may not be the same thing I'd interpret as fun. Well, fun, but, programming, what could be more fun than that? <laughs> but it is about problem solving. It is about, you know, enjoying yourself. And to me, an adventure game can be very frustrating. It has a certain solution that only one, per, you know, one the designer created and expects you to find. And I don't want that in a game. I want a just game that has multiple solutions and has multiple possibilities because I don't think the way this person would think. And so I want to have those options. So we design games thinking, what would the player do? What would they want to do? And what would they do if they were a magic user? How best to use those yeah. skills? Of course, that's uh, that's changed a lot in the intervening time as uh, the Internet uh, uh you know, it was available as ARPANET when I was in college, but it was not what it is today. Uh, and when you look at these original adventure games, there was no source for hints. There was no easy way. If you got stuck in something, you were stuck. And it was a total frustration. And that was actually part of the charm of the games, uh, was having that frustration coming back days or weeks later with that aha moment of, oh, I know what to, how to do this now. Uh, Zork, I actually went to... Uh, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons uh, convention in uh, Oakland, and they had a panel on uh, uh, adventure games, and uh, people said, well, do you have any questions? They were talking about, like, adventure game design. And I raised my hand and said, how do you solve this particular puzzle in Zork? And the guy said, I'll tell you after the thing. I don't want to spoil it for others. Uh, and that was the only way I got through uh, one of the, the bank puzzle in Zork. And it was uh, one of those uh, obvious but impossible to guess, uh, read the designer's mind type things. Uh, so today it's totally different because now people will go up on the web, the first sign of frustration, they'll go and they'll uh, find somebody else that solved the game 
read a walkthrough and get through it. And, you're, you know, they're kind of losing something of the charm of the games from that. But at the same time, they're losing the frustration. So it's, it's a very fine balancing act to make a game that is challenging and exciting uh, without making it so that people get frustrated, they, they go to the hint. And once you've gotten one hint, it's like eating salted peanuts. You can't stop with one. Uh, and, you know, maybe they only really needed help for that one, but now every time they get the slightest bump in the road, they're going to go and look for help. And more to the point, I, I mean, the other way of doing it with the RPG style that we had, if you got frustrated with a puzzle you weren't solving, oh, you could go off and kill a monster, beat up <laughs> something, get your frustration. There was always something else you could do instead. So if you couldn't solve a problem, you could let it, you know, mole in the back of your mind while you did something that was just as much fun. And so then you could come back with a fresh thing, and it wasn't a stopping point so much as just a challenge to get past. Yeah, so our intention on uh, some of the repetitive puzzles, uh, well, not really a puzzle, but like going to the Adventurer's Guild and running into the treadmill in order to build up your strength, uh, we didn't really intend for people to spend hours and hours uh, uh, doing that as a you know an obligation to do that. But it was something that you know we gave you alternative things you could do if you didn't know what to do, if you were thinking over a problem, uh, then you can go and relax for a little bit on the treadmill. <laughs> you know that talking about all the different ways you can enjoy the game, I noticed on YouTube there's some collections of uh, videos where people have gone in and died, you know, found all the different ways you can die, and some of these are really funny. I watched uh, one with the Dragon's Breath brew. Uh huh. Yeah. Just wondering, do you have a favorite death? I think the slug death. <laughs> yeah, in uh, Quest for Glory for uh, turning into a banana slug, uh, that uh, which uh, that of course had a history. As all these things that come in the game uh, come from real life experiences that have absolutely nothing to do with the game. Uh, so the banana slug, there had been a big controversy at University of California Santa Cruz. Uh, where they had, uh, you know, one of these traditional sports team uh, mascots, I can't remember, the, you know, the Wolverine or something, uh, and they had a poll for the uh, students to come up with the, uh, the new mascot, and they had, uh, you know, the politically correct uh, choices were listed for them. Well, a bunch of students got together uh, and had a write-in vote, because there was a space for a write-in vote, and they'd all written that we want to be the banana slugs, uh, and everybody was having such a good time with it that that was actually the winning vote, at which point the uh, university administration said, we can't be the banana slugs, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll make a mockery of us. Uh, a student said, hey, that's the winning vote. You better do that or you're disrespecting us as students. Uh, and they did. They tried to disrespect <laughs> them as students, but the students really, you know. They rebelled. They rebelled. <laughs> and so, yes, Santa Cruz has the banana slugs. But the reason why it's my favorite death that you touch a statue, you know it's bad, you know there's all these warnings, and you do it anyway, and you become this banana slug, and it's the silliest illustration of a smiling banana slug in the hero's outfit, and uh, it, that's why I love it, because it's funny. Yeah, so the player knows he's going to die, it's just that we surprise that the twist is how you die. And that was what, you know, I didn't play a lot of adventure games, and I didn't play them for very long, but... What the charm of Leisure Suit Larry was the deaths. What did you do? How you know what what happens when you try to do this? And if you get you die, you die. But the deaths were amusing, and I thought, okay, there's there's where the strength of an adventure game is that. Yeah, you <laughs> got your yeah yeah you got yourself slapped down for doing something, but you felt like yeah that was pretty funny, and. That's the good size side of an adventure game. Death was not a problem. It was part of the game. And so making a mistake all of a sudden isn't a bad thing. It's just a new experience. And I think that's a really good thing to learn. Although I have to admit, I played the, uh, the fan remake of uh, Quest for Glory 2, uh, Trial by Fire, which is a you know, really nice game. They did a great job on it. Uh, but I got enough into uh, the storyline as I was going through. Uh, I got into my uh, first combat and died in combat and suddenly realized that I had been playing the game for about 20 minutes and hadn't saved once. Uh, so it was like, oops! Yeah. <laughs> so we're not really adventure game players. Uh, and, 
you know, we always thought of our games as kind of easy and that we were giving you all the clues and hints of the game. And when we got feedback from players about this game was really hard and really challenging, we were like, oh, it was? Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> we didn't intend it to be. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the third slice of my interview with Lori and Corey Cole, which, uh, by the way, I, they sat down with me for over two hours, which really just shows how generous and kind these people are. They're willing to support the community. It's the least we can do uh, to support their awesome new, our awesome uh, Kickstarter project. It's not new anymore. Uh, but anyway, this, the time is really ticking on that, so if you haven't pledged, uh, please go over there as soon as possible. Remember, you can pledge uh, any amount uh, that you feel comfortable with. So even if you don't care about the game, uh, just do it for the, you know, to show our love and appreciation for, to uh, Lori and Corey Cole. Also, uh, don't forget the uh, uh, Dave Marsh's uh, Shadowgate Kickstarter. It's got about a week left. Uh, so probably by the time I'm doing the next episode, it'll be too late to mention that again. So if you haven't uh, supported that one, uh, that's another Kickstarter well worth your time. And uh, as always, I appreciate when you guys uh, support this show. I depend 100% on donations from people like you to keep these episodes and interviews coming. Uh, if you have uh, donated to the show, I really appreciate it, and thank you very much. If you want to learn how to do that, just go to armchairarcade.com and look for the Matt Chat link. Now, what about that all-important Ale of the Week? So the Ale of the Week is a Tommy Knocker Butthead Doppelbach Lager. Now I've been looking all over the label here and I do not see uh, how much alcohol is in this, which kind of concerns me because usually a Doppelbach is, is pretty strong, so <laughs> hopefully this won't knock me on my butt. Or maybe it will, thus the name Butthead. Uh, it's brewed in Idaho Springs, Colorado by the Tommy Knocker Company. Uh, Got a cool little story here on the back about apparently a Tommy knocker. Uh, were mischievous elves who slipped into mining camps with the Cornish miners in the 1800s. So it seems like an appropriate ale for a fantasy lover such as myself. So let's get this open and see what it's all about. So we've got this butthead Doppelbach lager here in the old drinking horn. And by the way, if you've been looking for your own drinking horn, I got a note from Bruno, uh, one of the supporters of Matt Chat. Send me a link to something called the Das Horn. <laughs> kind of a James Bond take on the on the drinking horn. So I'll post a link to that in case you guys are curious. It's a, a Kickstarter project. But anyway, uh, I've been smelling this. It smells really nice. Kind of a kind of a fragrant, uh, fruity kind of kind of like grapes. That's kind of what this smells like, to be honest. I, grapes are grape nuts. Uh, the cereal is actually what this is uh, reminding me of. Now, before I drink this, I want to offer a toast uh, to one of my fans named Nicholas Wilson. Now, Nicholas is actually an effects artist at Gearbox Software. And he wanted me to mention that they're just about to release uh, some DLC for Borderlands 2. Uh, that's called Mr. Torkey's... Oh, <laughs> let me need one of my crib notes here. Mr. Torkey's or Torks, I'm not really sure. Campaign of Carnage. That'll be available for 10 bucks. I've actually been playing uh, Borderlands 2 with my brother on a co-op, so I'm really looking forward to trying out that uh, DLC as soon as we finish the main campaign, of course. Anyway, let's give this uh, butthead a try. <clears throat> That's quite a complicated flavor. Kind of a Acidic, you know, it really, to, it tastes like wine or champagne is what this is kind of reminding me of. Definitely getting kind of that, a grape flavor. It's not really thick. It's got that, it just, it tastes like wine. <laughs> you know what? That's just what's uh, coming to mind here. Um, a little bit of a grape, a little bit of acidic. If you don't like the taste of, uh, of, of most beer, you might like this, especially if you like uh, wine and you've been looking for a beer that's <laughs> kind of uh, whiny. That didn't make a damn bit of sense, but I think it catch my drift. Mm. Anyway, quite good, quite refreshing. It's not thick and syrupy like a lot of these uh, Doppelbox can be. Uh, so anyway, I really enjoy this. I'm gonna go four out of five drinking horns on this. I highly recommend this if you like uh, uh, darker beers. Uh, now for the quotation this week I've got a uh, quotation from Bertrand Russell and it goes something like this. 
Democracy is the process by which people choose which man will get the blame. See you guys next week. Well, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. I got news for you, pal. You ain't leading but two things right now. Jack and shit. And Jack left town.